Ryan and Bradford Manning were diagnosed at a young age with Stargardt's disease, an eye disease that causes blindness over time. Uh, their disease inspired them to start a clothing line, Two Blind Brothers, in which all the proceeds of their sales goes to different charities and medical institutions that are finding a cure for blindness and other eye diseases. Brian and Brad are both graduates of the University of Virginia and reside in New York City. We are so honored and we thank them for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about your Stargardt's disease, when you both were first uh, diagnosed, what were the signs and symptoms and so forth? Sure, so Brian and I both have a, this juvenile form of macular degeneration. That's what Stargardt's is. And it's, it's really a condition that affects your center vision. Usually folks with Stargardt's disease keep a lot of their peripheral vision. And that's because um, you have a gene mutation that causes you to metabolize vitamin A inefficiently. It causes this byproduct in the center of your vision. It kills your cells over time. And um, the way that we found out that we had it, uh, I'm five years older than Brian. So I was in kindergarten and failed the kindergarten eye chart, which started this long hunt to figure out well, what had happened to my eyesight. And, you know, at first they thought I was making it up and then they, you know, couldn't find a good reason. And then, you know, there was all this speculation. They thought maybe my eyes, the muscles in my eyes weren't working correctly. Eventually what they do is they actually dye your blood and then they can see the scar tissue um, in, in, your, in your eye. And that's when they knew that we had Stargardt, uh, I had Stargardt's disease. And, uh, you know, I was young at the time, so I didn't have a lot of perspective on it. But, you know, it was a very, very tough moment on my mom. I didn't fully appreciate it until I talked to her years later. Um, but the doctor, you know, with, with these incurable conditions, the doctor walks in and says, hey, I got bad news. You have this eye condition. Uh, there's no cure. Uh, I don't know how fast or how dramatically you're going to lose your eyesight. Go home, get a magnifier, and good luck. And, um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the way it happened. Okay. And so this is, if I'm, if I'm right, this is a genetic disorder. Yep. Okay. So you said, Brian, uh, Brad, you're five years older than Brian. So, yeah. So, so, how, so, so yeah, so Brian, Brian came a little after me. <laughs> okay. And so, and then, and then when were you diagnosed at the same, at the same age too, Brian? Yeah. So five years later, I went, it, the, the, when I started having vision issues, it was a significantly swifter process because, you know, you have to remember 25 years ago, Stargardt's research was very much in its infant state. And, but they knew once, once they realized Brad had this disease and my eyesight started to go around the same time, uh, we basically went to the same doctor who, you know, did the, dyed my blood and kind of came out with the same prognosis. And how fast uh, ha did your eyesight deteriorate or has it deteriorated over time? Is it a slower process? Is it a, uh, was it a longer process? And like, what is your vision to date? I know that you said that you have your central most vision intact, or sorry, your central most vision impaired and then your peripheral vision um, lost. But so. Yeah, so, so how Stargardt's works is it's, kind of like a hockey stick, a backwards hockey stick, where in the first few years of your diagnosis is the vast majority of your vision loss. And they say after about 10 years, uh, your vision usually, there are, there are cases where this is not, not the situation, but in most cases, your vision after 10 years kind of flattens out okay. from where, where it is. And you're, you're at the eyesight that you'll be for quite a while. And, and to give that a little context, you know, I remember my, at the very beginning of ninth grade, going into high school, I could still make out 12 point font. I couldn't read a full book like that, but if I needed to look at a menu or do something along those lines, I could. By the time I got to my junior, senior year, that was basically entirely gone. 
And to give a little context, you know, Brad and I have 2400 vision. And for anybody who maybe doesn't know, 2020 means you can read a 20 point font from 20 feet away. Brad and I can read 400 point font from 20 feet away. Okay. Um, all right. Perfect. That makes sense. And so growing up, um, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit on some of the questions that I, um, I had sent, but so growing up, what type of, uh, technology, um, devices, um, did you guys use, um, was Braille something well, that you, um, learned, uh, you know, technology? So when we were, um, yeah, so, you know, what we, the, the, our greatest tool initially um, was like large print books, uh, pocket magnifiers. Um, when I got to, uh, when I got to like middle school um, and high school, we started taking Braille classes. That was a really kind of interesting experience for, for Brian and I as brothers because uh, essentially our parents came home and they were saying, you know, and actually I, I should back up a little bit because, you know, it's funny when we think about getting diagnosed with our eye condition, you, you know, there, there's, there's something else we were kind of di diagnosed with that day or came along with that condition. And that was this really strong aversion to a, a, vic to a victim mentality. And, and that was really the that really came from our mother. Um, the, the day that we got di that I got diagnosed, you know, my mom got in the car. Uh, you know, I was only like seven years old at the time, and she kind of like looks. She's like looking straight ahead before we like pull out of the driveway of the doctor's office, and she looks at me. She's looking forward, and then she says, "F this," and she goes, "Let's go get some ice cream." And we went to Friendly's ice cream shop. And for a long time, I actually thought that's what F this meant, that we're going to get Friendly's. Um, and, uh, and we went and got, we went to Blockbuster and, you know, and, and we rented this movie Air Bud where this golden retriever was shooting like three point baskets. And I remember sitting there eating ice cream, watching this dog uh, hit miracle shots to win a high school championship thinking, this is the best day of my life. And, and that really, continued throughout our whole life where our, our mom basically said, look, this is never going to dictate your life. This is never going to, you know, never going to be an excuse for you. This is a challenge, just like everyone has challenges. And, um, and that, you know, when I think about technology, when I think about assistance, you know, it's, I, I think it's important not to forget those psychological tools that we have. Because, because that actually probably was the greatest gift that we were given when we were coming up through school. We had the resources, um, we had the large print books, we had the magnifiers, we had the braille classes, but we also had the psychological tools that allowed us to be successful. No, including me, I totally, um, you know, understand and get, you know, that, you know, tools and, you know, accessibility to a um, variety of accommodations and supports is so important. I mean, otherwise, you know, I don't know where we would be in this world and how we would be succeeding um, for, for us who have differences. Um, but, okay. Now, in one of your videos um, that, that I randomly found on YouTube, Brad, you talk about the psychology of Stargardt's disease. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your take on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, Brian and I now having run this project for years, prior to this project, we had never really met that many people with a vision impairment, with any sort of physical differences at all. And it's given us a chance to reflect on our experience. And, um, and people have many different ways of coming through a challenge. And we felt so fortunate that whatever, either through our genetics, our parents, our circumstances, whatever it was, 
that we were given the, the psychological t tools to be successful. And, and some of that, I think, boils down to the fact that when you're a kid and you are given a unique challenge, all of a sudden, the normal path, the, the manual on life, no longer applies to you as neatly. So when you can't see something on the chalkboard and everybody else is sitting in their seat, you have to figure out whether you're going to ask the kid next to you to read it to you, talk to the teacher after class, you know, to, to, to try to figure out a strategy or to just get up out of your seat and walk to the board to read what's on it. And so if you think about that example taken through hundreds of circumstances, for us, it actually became a thing that helped us develop our assertiveness, our creativity, our resourcefulness. Um, it, it helped develop a sense of core confidence um, because we didn't sort of fit in neatly um, into the same game that everybody else was playing. And that, that um, understanding of resilience and embracing challenges ha has, in a twist of fate, been, been actually a real gift in our lives. And, you know, we may have gotten there without the eye condition. Maybe we would have found sort of another path or a particular goal we wanted to achieve. But, but we are grateful for the fact that we at least got there with the help of this eye condition. So how has your Stargardt's disease um, affected, if anything, um, more, I guess, when you were younger, um, social and like family life? Um, yeah, from a, from a social perspective, you know, that's one major challenge of Stargardt's disease, for Brad and I at least, is that recognizing faces and recognizing people becomes extremely challenging. And, you know, growing up in elementary, middle, and high school, like <clears throat> with, any, with anything that makes you different, there was obviously bullying, but, you know, there are kids that are bullied because they have big ears and there are, you know, kids will pick on anything that makes you different. And, but, uh, and Brad and I, you know, went through that as well as, as many do. And, but from a social aspect, that was one big challenge, especially when we got to college, because you would meet somebody in the lunchroom and then, or you'd meet them out in a class or whatever. And then they would say hi to you the next day and you would have absolutely no idea who they are. And as, as challenging or as difficult or as isolating as that could be, you know, I always took it as an opportunity because it just gave me the chance to treat everybody like they were my best friend until I could use the contextual clues like a game of guess who, if anybody remembers that old 90s board game, uh, to find out eventually who they are. And what, what it ended up doing more than anything was people that I didn't know were like, wow, Brian is so friendly and so positive. It actually made me a lot more friends than it probably took away just by changing the mindset from this is a little isolating. I don't know if I want to meet people because then I won't recognize, recognize them too. I want to meet everybody because I probably know who they are. I just don't know who they are yet. Uh, and, from, and from a family perspective, I mean, Stargard's made – Brad and I significantly closer. You know, we may take jabs at each other as often as we can, like any two brothers will. Uh, he's an easy target, so it's a little unfair. But what we, what we have, but, it, but because we were the only two people each other knew with Stargardt's disease, it gave us this shared bond, this, you know, shared activity and this, this understanding that it was really hard to achieve somewhere else. And so just even from that growing up together and being able to have those conversations of, Hey, how'd you do this? Oh, did you, did you want to play this sport? No, why not? Oh, cause you weren't good at it. Okay. That makes sense. Like, how'd you get around this problem? And it, in that aspect of our relationship really created quite a better brotherly bond than you maybe otherwise would get. All right. So you both went to the university of Virginia undergrad uh, now from what, from my, from my perspective and what I know through my whole college process, um, UVA is a mainstream school, um, mm -hmm. and it's not 
you know, it's not like a landmark college or um, Marymount Manhattan College that really supports people with um, differences or diseases and accommodations and so forth. So how did, um, how was UVA um, able to accommodate um, your needs, daily, academic, um, and so forth? You know, they did a pretty good job. Um, our parents' philosophy when we were applying to schools, you know, obviously we both just wanted to get into kind of like the best school that would give us the best chance of getting a decent job upon graduating. Mm -hmm. And then sort of one of the second criteria was, was essentially um, if we were going to a large enough school that it's likely they would have the departments to support, um, you know, whatever we may need. It's also a state school. And so they, they you know, they, there are certain requirements, uh, you know, very strict like ADA requirements that, you know, they're, they're fo that everyone has to follow, but that a state school is, is sort of uh, under the microscope a little bit more for. And, you know, we found them to be very accommodating. Um, I'm sh I wouldn't be shocked if somebody had sort of a different experience. Um, but for us, you know, our accommodations were like, uh, be like, like, for example, some of them worked out better than, than we even really needed. So I, the policy at the time when we went to school is this, is if you were a student, they said the students with disabilities, if you, they said, if you were a student with a disability that you were actually eligible to register for classes before other groups and because because it's a large school there's a lot of competition and there's stages and like you get seniority based on you know your year in school but to accommodate the students that could be in the right classrooms or with the right technology in that classroom to help you out they gave you a, a big preference so that that was an example of a situation where you know we benefited a lot um, because you know not only did we get the class and the teacher we wanted it was it, you know, we were getting, um, you know, the, the courses that we wanted to take. Uh, when we needed to take a test, they did a good job of making sure that we had our large print tests and materials and the extra time that we needed. Um, you know, other than, other than a few, and I guess the, the, the last thing is, you know, we felt our, our middle schools, our high schools, all of our other schooling prior to that probably did a worse job <sighs> than UVA. So by comparison, we actually thought we were getting a pretty great deal in terms of accommodations, probably because they were set up to handle um, students with differences better. And so that, that, was at least, that was at least my perspective. So inclusion and accessibility have um, come a long way over the years. Um, how have you specifically seen um, accessibility in terms of tools, um, technology, and so forth uh, improve um, over the years? And, you know, what specifically um, today is probably the most, um, and I'm sure there's more than one, but the most uh, useful and important um, tool or piece of technology that you use on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, as Brad said early on, all we had was large print textbooks in a pocket magnifier about the size of your palm that you would just put over things that they couldn't make large print, which was, let's just say not super efficient. <laughs> and then, and then we would go, and then there was the CCTVs, which had this little camera on an arm and would project onto a larger screen so you could move the book. And that was a big revelation because that made everything way, way faster. But now, you know, and, and I, frankly, Brad and I are not perfect on keeping up with the latest and greatest technology. And I'm sure there's a ton out there, but really one of the biggest jumps in quality of life for myself and Brad was kind of the iPhone two or three because the camera on it became so much better that you could take pictures of anything and zoom in really easily. It has a great triple tap zoom function where you can zoom in just on the screen itself. So if you're reading an article 
And then speech to text has gotten so good and text to speech has gotten so good that, you know, you can crank up the speed on my MacBook, on my phone, where I can read articles at, at really fast. I can dictate back to the, the phone and it does sometimes a better job at grammar than I do myself, which is a little disappointing. But, uh, but, they, but the, you know, the Apple products have really come a tremendously long way in allowing for accessibility and, you know, simple zoom functions have been awesome. But, you know, from an early age, even until today, I would say the best accessibility tool is usually the person next to you, <laughs> uh, you know, Hey, can you help me? And being able to ask for that help and being willing to put yourself out there a little bit is that can turn into such a huge benefit. Uh, when it comes to an accessibility tool. I know it's very low tech, but rarely do you get much better than just the person standing next to you. Unless it's Brad and I standing next to each other, then it's a, we're really not helping anybody. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, no, that, you know, that all makes sense. And, you know, fortunately, in today's world, you know, it's, it's so great that we have, you know, all this um, technology and the iPhone was the greatest um, invention of all my of all time from nah. jobs um, and iPads and, you know, all of that. Uh, so for your shirts at Two Blind Brothers, you your tags are um, Braille. Now, do you and I, I know we'd spoken a little bit about this, I think a little bit earlier and um, we were speaking, but um, how much do you use um, Braille to um, for your daily functioning? If, so when if, we were if, young, you know, when we, when we were young, we got pretty proficient with grade one and grade two Braille. Um, and, you know, our, our parents sort of guided us towards that in preparation for maybe like even more significant vision loss. Uh, then, you know, text to speech, audiobooks, magnification actually became tremendously useful. We actually have enough vision to read uh, and um, see things through those means. So for probably like a decade, uh, we really didn't use it as much. Um, and then when we were kind of uh, starting the clothing brand, uh, it came back. Uh, it came back in two ways. One, Brian and I always thought there was something very, very cool about Braille, that you're looking at or you're feeling these dots on a page, and to somebody who has no context for the language, it almost feels like breadcrumbs, or it feels like, you know, somebody dropped glue, you know, drops of glue onto a page. I mean, it means nothing to them. And it actually fascinates people who have no, who haven't ever looked at it or felt it before. And, um, and so there's something very beautiful. There's something very kind of aesthetically cool about it. It's also like a kind of an important icon and, and tool in the um, blind and visually impaired communities. And so we thought at, that we wanted to aesthetically use it in our in uh, you know our clothing, but then sort of the the obvious um, the, sort of the obvious thing from that. Well, how can we use this to make our clothing more inclusive and more accessible? Um, and it was kind of like you know we hadn't really thought about it this way, but one kind of principle of our brand that we always think about is if we can find a way to make someone who's watching or viewing or learning about our brand be jealous that they actually never had an eye condition, <laughs> then we're doing a pretty good job of empowering the blind and visually impaired community. And so, you know, oftentimes when we're seeing Braille incorporated somewhere, in a way it almost isolates because it, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit into the environment in a way where it's an afterthought of the product or if you're in a restaurant and they're bringing out the braille menu it's not beautiful and in the leather bound book that the other menu is so when we were doing it in our clothing we wanted to both have it have an aesthetic um, purpose and uh, and a functional purpose so on all of our clothes now we have some sort of braille de detailing 
oftentimes on the hem of our shirt, you know, we have the color of the shirt. So if somebody's picking out their shirt in the closet, they'll know what color it is. And we've had a lot of fun and have had like a really great dialogue thinking about inclusion and how to make Braille a cooler and, and more in, integrated part of the, of the clothing brand. Great. Um, I can't wait to see these shirts in person. <laughs> uh, so growing up, uh, did you guys always know that you wanted to um, give back and um, fight for research um, to cure blindness? And then also um, what I think is so unique about um, two blind brothers um, and you guys is that from what I take is that you do not take an income from it. So all the um, everything, all the sales that you make and so forth um, goes directly to research. Yeah, I mean, Brad and I growing up ne never really had huge aspirations to be fashion designers. I, our, when we were first starting the brand, my dad said, it summed it up well by saying, you two are terrible dressers. You think you're going to dress other people? Uh, a little lighthearted, but you know, we actually, and you know, we really did start this brand because of some very exciting science. Uh, there's a young man named Yannick Duet who had a disease called laborous congenital amaurosis, which basically causes blindness in children. And there was a drug uh, made, called Luxterna made by a, it's a gene therapy. And it's truly miraculous because one injection of this gene therapy takes about uh, 1300 children and will take them from blind to sighted from reading braille to reading print, which we thought was just probably the most miraculous thing we'd ever heard. And this all happened because of a charitable gift from an organization that we're very close with, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, in 1996. Just a small gift to a, to a single researcher that sparked this whole journey to the creation of this drug. And so Brad and I were really excited about that idea. And then we had a few fun coincidences happen. And so we started the clothing brand, but the idea always was our main goal is to make the softest, best feeling, best looking shirts on the planet. And then to give a hundred percent of the profits back to those retinal researchers to try and make the small gift on the days that we could, on the times that we could 20 years from now, that next disease would be cured and that the next kid would be given that eyesight and that next mother was not going to be told, go home and prefer for your kid to go blind. It would say, step into this room, we'll give your kid treatment and you're not going to have to worry about that. And so that's always been our major, our major goal. And it's been a big core tenant of the brand is to try and find, try and be able to funnel as much money and as much goodwill to those researchers as we possibly can. I think it's amazing and I think that um, specifically for those including myself because I don't take an income um, that can do that can do this and give all the money to research it's just it's amazing because the more money that research has the more you know advancements and treatments and hopefully finding a cure um, you know will happen um, and you know I think I, and I believe that, you know, the shirts that you guys make and the clothing, um, you know, makes people, you know, that, that buy it, you know, feel good and feel more confident, you know, knowing that they were, it was specifically um, made, you know, in aligned to, you know, and with the awareness, you know, of their condition. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I should mention too that the, you know, the, the charitable dollars that go to research, you know, that that's that's one that's one piece, and it's an important piece of the mission. And, but we, there are a few other things that are, are we get really excited about when it comes to the community. One is obviously kind of like some of the principles that we try to put out there through the through the media of the brand that you know that 
these challenges don't need to um, dictate your life, that you can, you can embrace these things, you can be successful, not only in spite of, but because of these things. And also the, the community piece around the, you know, the production. Um, one of the kind of cool things that we've been able to do is work with uh, organizations like Dallas Lighthouse for the Blind, Industries for the Blind, and they actually have helped us produce um, some of our products. Uh, these are organizations that hire like a 70% um, you know, blind or vision impaired workforce. And, um, and, and that's been like, that's been really, really, really touching and really kind of a cool thing. We never knew that organizations like that existed prior to starting this brand. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So, um, and we spoke a little bit about this, but um, in terms of the um, funds that you give, like you said, you mentioned um, the Dallas organization. So the funds that you give to charities and um, other you know, research centers and so forth, um, what have you seen over, you know, you can just say like, the, you know, five years, 10 years, whatever you want to say, um, how have you seen research and um, treatments improve what, you know, what type of gene therapies, you know, are, mm -hmm. you know what are they working on, um, and so forth. So it's interesting. So there's a, cu there's a couple things. Um, sort of the biggest milestone in this space was probably uh, recently sort of the most impactful was was two years ago with uh, uh, Luxterna, the therapy that uh, helps reverse LCA. Um, and where where Two Blind Brothers charitable dollars are going, they're going in to see the researcher that is helping to advance to, so that that researcher's therapy will be available after, you know, proving out their concept, attracting private capital, getting a big biotech or pharma company to come in and take it through clinical trials. You know, we're trying to fund that part of the process that's hardest for them to raise their funds. Um, but a couple examples of projects that we're excited about is like um, a, a woman, um, a researcher at the University of Florida, uh, Shannon Boyd. Um, and what she's trying to do, so, um, Brian and I have a gene called, our issue is in a gene called the ABCA4 gene, and it's a very large gene. So it doesn't fit into the same kind of, it's actually, when they do gene therapy, they use it in a virus. Our gene doesn't fit in the same virus that the LCA RP65, the Luxterna treatment does. So what Shannon Boyd is doing is she's figuring out how to kind of chop that gene in half, take two viruses get that gene into the cell into the cell and have it repair itself um there's like probably 15 other kind of science fiction type things mm -hmm. that uh that folks are are working on but one of the things that's been very clear to us is that the science has come so far that it's not like it was 40 years ago where you were kind of wondering if therapies could actually be developed for these things. Um, now we're at the stage where we know how to cure some of these things. It's just a matter of funding and time and execution to bring them over the finish line. One of the things that we're very excited about is that that researcher that Brian mentioned in the mid 90s that found the RP65 LCA gene that became a therapy, she is now working on half a dozen other uh, gene therapies that are going to cure half a dozen um, uh, more retinal eye diseases. Uh, her, her, by the way, her name is Jean Bennett, and she's like a rock star scientist. She, she's she's sort of like if Iron Man was like a was a female, she would be she's Iron Woman, is what she yeah. is. Um, but but there's a lot there's a lot to get excited about. Um, you know, for Brian and I, fun, uh, you know, Two Blind Brothers funds sort of the whole spectrum of retinal eye disease. But as it relates to us, you know, Shannon Boyd's work is interesting. There's two other companies, AGTC and Nightstar, that have clinical trials. There's 25 clinical trials right now for retinal eye disease. So we are going to see a lot of therapies coming over the next five, 10 years. It's exciting, really, really exciting. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, in terms of um, your your customers and who um, buys your buys you know two blind brothers um, shirts and clothing, uh, who do you see in terms of um, population uh, buying the clothing? Are there me? I mean, obviously women, adults, kids, um, but is there any like specific, um, you know, target that you see? Um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 hey, we're a big, big fan of anybody who wants to put on a two point brother shirt. They don't need to fall into any category. The only category that matters is that if you want, if you want to be comfortable and look great, you're our customer. Uh, and you know, we find that we're, it's, it's hard for us to track this, but we feel that a lot of our customer base are individuals who sympathize with, uh, visual impairment, who sympathize with having retinal eye disease. Maybe they have a brother or a sister or a cousin or a mom or a dad or anybody who has it that connects mm -hmm. them closer to our story. But you know, really, we're, we, our clothes are made for, for everyone to be as comfortable and to be as, as productive as possible. So we're really trying our best to be as inclusive in that, in that aspect as, as we can be. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you know and, and I will, but, you know, for me to buy, like, one of your shirts from somebody who has a difference um, would be because I want to like support obviously research, you know, and understand and like you said, have sympathy and empathy, um, you know, towards, you know, people like yourself who have, you know, eye diseases. Uh, with what one you know, the, now, one of the, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was gonna say, you know, one of the things that we didn't really anticipate when we started this project and, you know, maybe you're seeing this with the different enable community as well is, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there weren't sort of efficient resources to talk to these sort of smaller uh, communities by, and I mean smaller just by comparison, where like 10 or 15 years ago, if we wanted to tell somebody about our clothing brand, we would have had to do like daytime TV ads or a Super Bowl ad or something like that, where, I think one of the things that Two Blind Brothers has benefited from is, you know, these communities are actually, they have a lot of energy in them and they have a lot of support, but they didn't necessarily have the technology, the digital age or the social media to sort of connect them all. So when you think about the fact that, you know, there's 20 million people in the U.S., that are uh, 15 million people in the U.S. who have like a retinal eye disease because it's either adult macular degeneration or Stargardt's or retinitis pigmentosa. You're, when you're reaching one in, you know, whatever it is, one in 20, one in 30 people, and they, when they see your story, your brand or your community, to them, they, they, they feel a very deep connection, but it's actually, but part of that is the fact that we've traditionally done a bad job of actually connecting these communities. And so we benefited from the fact that when somebody who has a connection, which are a lot of people, if you think about one in 20 or one in 30 people, they're thinking of their grandparents or like Brian said, their family members. And, um, you know, people feel an affinity towards these, towards these conditions, towards these challenges. And we've been the beneficiary of tapping into that energy and, and trying to have a dialogue with that community. It's, it's great. Um, so with what you know now um, about yourselves, you know, how much you've improved, where you are um, in your career, um, what would you have told your younger self 10, 20 years, um, even when you were diagnosed as a child? Don't listen to Brad, whatever you do. He's just, he's not going to give you good advice. It, it'll, it'll usually turns out for, it, only in tears. Uh, no, I, I, you know, the best piece of advice that, that I think is, uh, that I've gotten is, you know, the worst that really can happen is, is somebody can say no. If you need help, if you need assistance, if you need anything, you should ask because the worst thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to say no to you and you're gonna be in the exact same place that you were before you asked. 
So if you, so really be willing to put yourself out there and ask because you'll find that in so many situations, you save yourself a lot of time, you save yourself a lot of energy, you save yourself a lot of headaches by just asking and being okay and comfortable with hearing no. And I, I think that's a, that's a really important one. And as it relates to Stargardt's and eye disease and any you know, challenge or difference, your challenge, that challenge is going and will make you a better, stronger and more capable person. If you're willing to put in the work and overcome the obstacles and actually fight through the, the hardships of it, you will be able to come out on the other side a better person because of it. And so don't shy away from the challenge, lean into them and embrace them to the best of your ability because it is it, those moments are the ones that are going to define you the best. Great advice. Now, um, specifically, because actually there is one person on our community um, whose son was just diagnosed at age nine with star guards. Um, and a lot of the questions that I asked, um, in addition to my own, um, tied into what she wanted to ask you guys. Um, but and maybe you can talk a little bit about your mom and your dad's experience. Um, but as new parents, or not new parents, but as parents um, who've had, who have a child or children, like you two brought, you know, brothers, um, two sons, um, who have been recently um, diagnosed, what would you, what would you tell the parents? Um, or what would your parents tell the parents about this condition? You know, I would say, well, I'll tell you first what our, what our parents did for us. And one thing that we've come to appreciate is that um, you have to kind of meet people where they are. People are in different stages when they come in contact with a new challenge and your perspective at one stage may change and you might need different perspectives at different stages. So our parents, when we were very young, they actually mitigated, minimized, and almost made the vision impairment um, into an afterthought. Uh, it, it was, you know, it, it was, it was, it was brought up when we would bring it up. Um, but other than that, it's like they let us try out for, you know, the t-ball team. They let me take Japanese in high school, and and they never even said something like, hey, you know, uh, you might want to pick something that's a little less visually intense. Um, they did try to steer us in the background. So like my big sport was swimming and they like kind of gently steered me into that without telling me, Hey, we're doing this because you, you may not be able to see, but swimming is a sport you could probably do if you have some vision. Um, but what happened is th that, you know, the challenge evolved, you know, the hardest moments for us were probably middle school in high school where the social pressure is a lot greater and to your previous question you know I, I just wish that so what happens is when you're faced with one of these situations you try out all these new strategies and and unfortunately one of the most uncomfortable times is when you're trying to avoid it um, and when you're trying to hide it and you're embarrassed by it and so you end up you know, creating these situations where you're not participating or you're, you know, sitting in the background or you're, you're, you're just fearing people finding out something. And, and then inevitably you find out that actually the, the best strategy is the way that you sort of treat it is the way other people treat it and fully embracing it and kind of showing that authenticity and that vulnerability in a weird way is very attractive to you know the, your friends, your social group, et cetera. And so, you know, but for a new, a new parent, you know, I, I, think, I think it's finding that balance where you constantly cultivate that spirit in your kid to embrace challenges. They need to feel like a challenge is, is not something to be totally afraid of or to shy, from, uh, shy away from. And they, they need to make sure that they know that they're, 
their particular challenge does not make them less than. You know, uh, that, that if they can relativize it in the sense that we all have challenges, this is your particular journey, and, you know, you're still on the field, um, you know, to compete with everybody else, and you have a very good chance of out-competing them because you actually have a unique perspective. That, you know, if you can cultivate that, I think you're off to a great start. I think it's great. It's, again, great advice. Uh, so uh, what resources um, can you give us uh, that, you know, um, for Stargardt's disease, um, or are the resources for Star Stargardt's disease more, um, you know, on the general level of just eye diseases in general and blindness? I think if you want to stay abreast of any of the research information, uh, I think Foundation Fighting Blindness at blindness.org is a phenomenal resource for that. And they have a lot of localized chapters as well. If you're looking for somebody in your area who has a retinal eye disease, you know, that's a really good place to start. And I know some of these chapters can be pretty big in places you maybe wouldn't suspect them to be. Uh, you know, and the other, and you know, I think a lot of the Americans with Disabilities Act is a great resource with anybody for anybody who has a disability. There are specific rights that you have with somebody with a challenge or a disability that that you should know and understand just in case of a situation. And you know, the best resource is, as Brad was kind of talking about, is having a good attitude, and that goes for anybody with any situation anywhere you know if you can be positive and you can be comfortable and you can be confident with who you are and what's happening in your life i know that's not easy especially right now and there's days where it's not going to be that simple but having that attitude after you understand the technical resources is going to be the most valuable thing you could possibly have yeah, and I'll, I'll throw on a couple other resources, and these are folks that, you know, we've come in contact with just through the Two Blind Brothers Project, but, like, if you're interested in, like, low vision or, or tech for people who are blind or visually impaired, there's Sam, who runs a YouTube channel called The Blind Life, or who reviews all kinds of tech. If you're looking for kind of people who have done kind of incredible things, um, despite sort of a visual challenge, you should look up, you know, Eric Weinmayer, uh, who's hiked all the tallest peaks in the world. Look up, you know, even people like Molly Burke, who's a, who, who we've met, who's a, um, who's a blind YouTuber. Um, you know, if you're Parker like Dupree, Brian said, on the research side. Swimmer. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, uh, you, you know, there, there's resources for you, uh, depending on sort of the stage you're at and the information that you're interested in. And uh, th those are definitely some of the ones that we've been impressed by. I think those will be great resources for our community. Oh, actually one more too, one more. Um, so we got to, so there's a, a band, Ex Ambassadors, Casey and Sam, mm -hmm. and you'll know their song Unsteady and Renegades. Yeah. Um, Casey's blind. And uh, they, they are really great guys. We're actually getting ready to kind of host a, a virtual uh, event with them soon. And uh, they're just another just phenomenal pair of brothers. Um, you know, they, they've done, they're kind of, uh, they have a close connection to, the, that, to that community. And, and they're just, uh, and their music is, is amazing. In closing, you know, that, you know, embrace your difference and, you know, it's, it's okay to live with the challenge. Um, you can still do mm -hmm. amazing things like you guys are doing. Um, so. Oh, yeah, you know, oftentimes, you know, not all the time, but oftentimes when you can't change your situation, you change yourself. Mm -hmm. And that comes in the form of resourcefulness, assertiveness, creativity, um, and, and, and that's something that we've learned by watching some of the most successful people we've ever met who've had sort of a variety of challenges. And I also should have mentioned, you know, our mutual friend, Rebecca Alexander, as an, as an example of that as well.
Yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. Well, this was wonderful, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this.